The following presentation is a pre-recorded version of the workshop presented at the EFS Fellows Teaching Philosophies seminar that was held on the 28th of the 10th, 2021. The seminar was held under Chatham House Rule, so no content could be ascribed to any one speaker, and therefore we didn't record that workshop. This is a pre-recorded version, prepared in advance, and available somewhere on the internet, since you're watching it now. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Dan. I'm a marketer. I'm a senior lecturer at the Research School of Management in the College of Business and Economics. And my background is I'm an innovation researcher. I'm also a senior fellow of the Advanced HE, Higher Education Academy, and I'm a certified LEGO Series Play facilitator. So there's a lot of skill bases to the way in which I approach the higher education space and what I do inside my classrooms. So the question we were posed is to talk about what sparked our interests in teaching. And in my case, uh, I've had two paths here. I first sort of fell into the role and then I intentionally came back from industry to academia because I missed the marking and I missed being able to do the transformative change processes that teaching lets you both experience as a teacher but also lets you guide students through as your learners. So my interest has been both as a education technologist and a marketer in saying, how do I get people along this journey, along this pathway? So a quick bit to my backstory is my PhD way back in the 90s was on ultra new innovations and I've brought that process to my workspace. Uh, I'm very much described as technology curious. I look at things and go, what can be done with it? What can I do with it? And what does it want to have done with it? Uh, which is, I've done things like I've brought Twitter accounts and Instagram accounts to my classroom as distribution channels for my ideas. I've applied the LEGO Series Play protocol, a commercial facilitation tool, into the education space to help people with their workshops and help people with their assignments. And also, I uh, bought a teddy bear and had it available as the emergency stress relief teddy bear during a semester in which my students were facing a particularly tough end of semester assignment. So I'm prone to trying anything twice and my process is driven by a theoretical worldview as well. So I like to use the SAMA model, Substitution, Augmentation, Modification, Redefinition. But one of the things about it is that I recognize that when you are learning and you are picking up new knowledge, you're engaged in the innovation adoption process. So you also want to ask the question of, when I'm teaching someone, am I teaching them something that's going to substitute what they already know, augment what they know, or allow them to modify their behaviors or redefine worldviews and the way they approach? So it's an interesting process, it's a complex challenge, and it does occasionally lead us to moments where we're looking at the other issue of innovation adoption, which is innovation rejection. But we try and get around that. In terms of things I'm currently doing in the classroom, uh, I'm a big fan of Turnitin. I don't think it's any use as a, a tool for tracking changes or tracking um, plagiarism. I think it is a magnificent platform for being able to give guided feedback to my students. So I make extensive use of the quick marks. Uh, you can see my drag and drop library here. Uh, detailed upgrades, long paragraphs, links to external resources, things that you drop in at the top of the paper when the students have got an ongoing, okay, there's been a recurrent thing you need to fix. Here's a world of advice I can provide to you so you can fix it. What I've also used uh, this semester, I have a large participation and engagement. It's worth 20%. It's held across a range of different opportunities. So I went and did a mid-semester evaluation where I looked at to what extent people had used these opportunities. Then coded that up nicely in my Excel file, created a mail merge and handed this back to the students through a formative assessment task on Wattle and said, here, here's my appraisal of are you actually using these platforms 
and does this match up with what you intended to do with your semester? And where there was mismatch, students had the opportunity to go, oh, oh right, I've missed something. But also one of the things I like to do with a student cohort is I do like to bring them into some of the decision loops. And one of the things that I did this season, and I've done for a couple of years, is ask what would be useful feedback. So the EPR is the final assessment task uh, in the final assignment in the marketing subject. And asking them what would they like to have this focus on, I've got feedback from students saying, look, it'd be great if you could talk to how well we use theory. We could take that skill and apply it in other subjects, in later subjects. The other thing I always ask is, uh, I ask a question around what could be done differently, because different and better are two different categories. I'm also using a lot of front-end loading. Uh, I like to set up clear student guidelines. I have an assignment video, an assignment uh, PowerPoint presentation and a, comp a companion Word document. This lays out my expectations, but also gives me a chance to go into some depth around things like instructions, around my marking rubrics, around how I intend to provide feedback, and also what I intend to create in terms of an environment where you learn through the assignment, you learn with the assessment, from the assessment, and for the assessment. This also is uh, the opportunity to go, as I said, go deep on the uh, rubrics. And the technique I've been using is to use a metaphor-based rubric. Again, this is an idea to go and turn the rubric from, well, the, you are a very good writer, into, well, this is the kind of assignment that would be like. Uh, and I've described in terms of songs you'd skip on Spotify or movies that you'd watch on TV or YouTube clips that you play again. Bring it away from the dry technical, having that element in there as well, but also providing them with a way that they can see what they should feel. Part of this, well, all this then loops around into the idea of using the Turnitin three minute custom feedback. And so I want to say here, in terms of things that work well, uh, this is a catastrophic success. It works so well that uh, I have every student wanting a personalized voice message from me. So three minutes by however many students you've got occasionally means you get through a lot of lemon and honey and you don't have a lot of voice at the end doesn't always scale, that's one of the things. The bigger your class is, the more you've got to outsource this to your teams. Uh, but also the thing with the voice feedback is that you get to use your emotion. You get to express happiness and pride. Now if someone's done something dumb in the assignment, tried to cheat, you can express disappointment. But mostly you get to express happiness, enthusiasm and pride and tell students, hey, this thing you did, you did well. But one of the other things I want to mention is like my whole philosophy is based around going first and trying things out and part of that is things go wrong. I just want to mention a few of the things that have failed over time. Uh, I tried an alternate week format where there would just be six classes and you do your class on second, you know, every second week. Time totally hated that more than the students did and the students really hated it. Face-to-face uh, -face lecture attendance, that's just, I used to be the stand and deliver stage on the stage type, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, printing things out in A3 workshops, that also, big printed pieces of paper became big things I put, kept putting into the recycling bin afterwards, so those weren't working. And the last thing was, this season I completely stuffed up my wattle layout because I had it on compacted mode and my students didn't know didn't recognize to click the link. So why do I do all the new things? Well, will start with I've got a peculiar skill base that allows me to go first. Uh, I'm trained in understanding technology and innovation adoption. But also if I can blaze a pathway through, if I can create the space, if the policy gets written after I've created the gap it needs to fill, then I can pass this on to others. I can test things out first, take the hit, take the notes, hand it off to someone else and say, hey, implement this. 
So one of the things that I do is I, I do live my philosophy, I do live my theory. So my teaching, my philosophy of teaching is to apply not just research led intervention, but interventions that guided my research. So with that, uh, any questions, leave them in the comment section below or throw us a connection. Now one of the things I just want to briefly talk to is that uh, this recording done here is being captured through open broadcast software, OBS. Uh, it's set up in a split screen as you can see. The camera is positioned so it's just off to the side and you can see the screenshot of how the PowerPoint is laid out. So the PowerPoint sits off to one side of the screen, just over there, and I lay, in OBS you can use multiple layers, so the little bracketed bars around me are a transparent PNG overlay and that does the brand identity. Now this is the brand identification that I use for my course. So this is what my weekly lectures are done in, the PowerPoint to one side, talking head to the other, brand material in the middle. It also lets me do things like I can do PowerPoint as an overlay so I can have little texts and words coming up beside me. This is one of the things I was testing out this season in terms of changing the way in which I delivered pre-recorded lectures. So there was more me being able to lean in and be excited and still the things you come to expect because sometimes you just need a model or you need a diagram or you need a definition on the screen whilst you talk to the camera and the screen does its thing. So this is how we set up to run OBS uh, based PowerPoint captures and this is what I use to record this session and here's a little uh, free upgrade advice for if you want to do this these are some of the steps to take. Get yourself a copy of OBS, play around with the different layering and the movement of parts and pieces and the PNG, the transparent PNGs can be created in PowerPoint itself, in fact whilst this was created uh, in Photoshop because I have access to it the test versions of this were created in the PowerPoint. And the last bit of advice is when you set this up in your first instance and you've got your camera where you think you want it to be, take a screenshot of your video screen, bring it back into your PowerPoint and then you can line up your template so you know where the edge of the screen needs to be. Because one of the things that is also great about uh, this being a real-time live video streaming system is I can move the PowerPoint just to show you that this is what it's as you see on the screenshot below that's what it looks like and the camera I've got a whole bunch of stuff off to the side but when it's layered into place you hold it still you just make certain you cut the edge there and students none the wiser this also outputs into a file format of MP4, so OBS can either use its um, inherent MKV file format, which uploads to YouTube and uploads to Echo360, but also you can um, convert to MP4 reasonably quickly and easily. So have a look at it, give it a consideration. It's one of those bonus features that's of the thing you can use. And uh, as I said, one of the things I like to do is I uh, like to go first and try things out and then share the knowledge and share this is what I'm doing with OBS this season.